Won't you open your Bibles to John chapter 6 and verse 63. It says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. This is Jesus speaking. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. This verse is really important for me because it plays in a very succinct way, a a role in encapsulating where it is that we're going. It's important that people have history because history establishes you for your future. Are you with us this morning? No, that's that's not the deep it. Hopefully we'll get to something. Don't lose me at that, but that's the shallow end. It's important that we have some history because God's going to take you on a journey and he's going to do some stuff in your life that's going to prepare you for where he wants to take you. He's going to get you and he's going to prepare you for what your future looks like. So never be at a place where we don't value where we've been or what's happened in our life, the the contribution that he's put into our life. It's an important part of things, but we don't stay there. So we move on to where God has called us and what he is inviting us into. Where living faith has been as a church has been fundamental because it's established the foundation of who we are and what we're all about. But I believe that the mandate that God has given us right at the moment and what he's called us into is build on the rock. Build. You have the foundation. Do something on the structure. (laughs) Me and Mrs. Boateng are together. (laughs) Build on the rock. He's going to do something with what's being established at Living Faith and he's going to do something with what's established in your life. But he's the one who's going to do it. So he's introducing us and he's inviting us to move to a place where we start to recognize what it is that he's wanting to do and we partner with him so that we can move in and follow the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. We need to follow him. We're following what the Spirit wants to do and we're being sensitive to his input in our life so that we can step into and and we can embrace our responsibility in that. We started speaking last week and one of the key points that I really wanted you to get out of last week was that God was going to do an in-working in you so that there can be an indwelling. God is going to do something on the inside of you when you met him, where what he does is he takes everything that used to constitute your nature and he wipes it all away and he makes you brand new. And he gives you his nature. He gives you his spirit. He makes your spirit reflective of his nature. You become a brand new creation. He cleans everything up so that he has a habitat. And when he has a habitat that looks brand new, he says, fine, I'm really excited because I'm moving in. He takes of his spirit and he puts it inside of us. If you are a born again believer, everywhere that you go, you have the spirit of God inside of you. Everywhere that you go, you have the spirit of God inside of you. When was the last time he had influence? When was the last time he said to you, say this, don't say that. Do this, don't do that. It becomes important for us, and I don't mean to, to, I just want to go some places today. Just let me roam without being politically correct. Can I do that? Yes. Okay. It just, the, what I'm trying to point out to you is the significance of what we have on the inside of us. And the desire of God is to have influence in our lives. And what I'm trying to say to you is that the call to who we are as Christians is to learn how to live a life so that we live from the life that's on the inside of us. It's not about developing a whole bunch of rules and regulations and living a a good moral life. There are a lot of people who are not even believers who have good moral lives, but they don't have the life of God inside of them. You should be a a morally upright person, but that's a byproduct of the life. That's not the ultimate objective of what he's called you into. He's put his life on the inside of you. Why has he done that? Think about the creator of the universe, the creator of everything that you see, the creator of everything that is, says I'm coming to come and live on the inside of you. Think about the potential and the power that is resident on the inside of you. For what? For too many Christians, we neglect the reality of what's living on the inside of us. Peter, and everybody knows the story, they're caught in a storm and Jesus comes walking on the water and Jesus says to Peter, get out of the boat and come to me. He 
got Jesus' words, and what did he do? He made a decision that he was going to step over the edge and he was going to walk towards Jesus. He did it when everybody else was sitting in the boat. People like to stay in the boat because the boat is comfortable. The boat is safe. The boat is what everybody else does. But if you want to live life, you've got to adopt a little bit of risky business. If you, want to adopt, if you really want to live life to the fullest, step over the edge and take a, a walk with God. That's where we are. We can spend all, with all of eternity in the boat and we can be happy Christians who come to church and do that regular stuff all of the time. But it's mundane and it's expected and it's so unexciting. Imagine what would happen if you went home one day and you told your husband or wife about the fact that you went to church and you got to walk on the water. Do you think it would make an impact? I think so. Now, people will come to church if you walk on water, but they don't going to come to your church if you sit in the boat. What are you going to give me? You safe? Everybody's safe. God's calling us to walk on the water. God's calling us to do something. And the problem that we have as human beings is that the way that we survive in the natural world and the way that we get ourselves to a place where we're able to be functional and successful is that we, we become knowledge-based people. We become people of understanding. And because of that, it becomes such a key part of who we are as people. And we use that and it becomes something that begins to define the life on the inside of me. And I take something which has so much potential and I reduce it down to my understanding. But I don't understand how God could do something like that. Why do you have to understand? Why do you have to understand? Jesus went and he met with a young man who'd been blind since his birth and he healed him. And what happened? All the religious of people of the day were in an uproar and they all carried on and they said, tell us about it because we don't understand it. And we're not happy about this person because we don't believe that it's somebody who's supposed to be the Messiah. And they were trying to get a knowledge and an understanding of what had happened. And he said to them, you know what? I can't tell you. He said, all I know is once I was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. There are things that we call encounters that are transformational. We talk about encounters, and sometimes I think it's important to give a little bit of definition as to what an encounter is. An encounter is when we reach that place where we recognize that the God of the universe is on the inside of me. His spirit dwells on the inside of me. And there are times where if I can be obedient to him and I can connect with him, I can, he can walk me into something which is transformational. Transformational means changed. Transformational means I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know how it happened. I can't tell you, but God. There are places in our Christianity where it has to be but God moments. If we don't have but God moments, we are living in the boat. Well, I know what he's going to do and I know how it's going to be and I know how the storm's going to work and I know what, what happens with the boat. It's boring because it's everything that I can manage. It's everything that I understand. It's everything that I can lay hold of. It's everything that I can control. And what we can control is so limited to what God can do. But if we don't expand who we are and we don't move to a place where we sit and say, I'm not prepared to allow my intellect and my understanding to define the God of the universe anymore. And I'm prepared to do some stuff that is really silly in the world. I'll step over the edge of the boat. It doesn't make sense. And by all accounts, I should sink and drown. But I'll give it a shot because he called me. That is called Christian living. So that's where we're going. We're not silly, we're not irresponsible, we're not doing things that are heightened and hypeful just so that we can get reaction. What we're talking about is we're talking about connecting to the God of the universe who has placed his life on the inside of us and sitting, saying, give us direction and introduce me to a new way of living that's different to where I've been. I have an appetite for something more. If you are born again, you've had an encounter. If you are born again, you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and it changed you. 
If you were born again, something happened on the inside of you that you may not be able to define and you may not be able to even give description of and perhaps you can't even articulate it. But all you know in yourself is that I used to be like this and I know that something changed in me. Because if I go to the places I used to go, I don't feel comfortable anymore. There's something on the inside of me that says, you shouldn't be here. It changed. I didn't do it. It happened to me. There's something on the inside of me that makes me hungry to go to church. I didn't want to go to church. Something happened. Something happened. There's something on the inside of me that doesn't let me behave the way that I used to behave. Because anytime I start doing things that are hurtful and nasty, something on the inside of me says, that's not who you are. What happened to me? I don't know, but I had an encounter. I had an encounter. Something changed me. Yes, I can label it. I got born again. But it was much deeper than a label. It was fundamental to my life. I had an encounter. We want encounters. We want things that change us. Not because I did something. Not because I followed a formula. Not because I had a better understanding of to, as to how I could control something. But because the greater one on the inside of me moved me into an, into an encounter with him that changed something fundamentally in who I am. It was the first time that you came in contact with the Holy Spirit. It was the first time you came in contact with the Holy Spirit. And something happened. Something happened. He moved you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He did something inside of you. He gave you a brand new nature. He got rid of everything that used to define the way you were and he stepped you into newness. And then he said, you know what? I'm going to put my life inside of that. Something happened. The day that you were born again, it should leave an indelible mark on your life. It should be a reality that's so deep and so much a part of who you are that you're able to pinpoint to that moment and sit and say, I remember when it happened. I had an encounter. And I changed. I'm talking about something which is transformational. I'm not talking about something that's dramatic. Don't confuse the two. Sometimes in the church, we think that when God is, does something, when God has an encounter with people, if they're not pyrotechnics involved, it can't really be spiritual. Did I see a hand on the wall? Was there writing? Were there sparks? Did gold dust fall from the sky? Maybe it was an encounter. It was an encounter because once I was blind, but now I see. It's an encounter because something happened on the inside of me that totally shifted and changed who I was. And I became a brand new creation. You may not even recognize that you had an encounter, but you did because only the Holy Spirit could make you new. Only he could do that work. You can't do that work in yourself. So we had an encounter. Encounters are important because when we have encounters with God, what ends up happening is it puts us at a place where we can go and we can share with something which is so much more compelling, so much more interesting and so much full of life when I can refer to an encounter that I had as opposed to an idea that I have. You can only give people what you've encountered. So we become hungry for encounters because when we have encounters, what ends up happening is it introduces us to the opportunity to partake of something called a testimony. We need testimonies. What is a testimony? A testimony is compelling evidence of the fact that I had an encounter with the God of the universe. That's what a testimony is. It's compelling evidence when you go home and you used to be the most nasty, hateful, ugly person and all of a sudden things change on the inside of you and what ends up happening is your wife says to you, what happened to you? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right, Rafa? 
what happened to you? You always told me you were going to change. You always told me you wouldn't do that. You always told me you wouldn't behave that way. You always told me you were going to give that up, but you never did. But change happened because you had an encounter. You had an encounter. It was nothing I could do because everything was about him. That's what we need in our lives. That's what we need in our churches. When we have encounters, that's when the world will pay, up and, uh, will pay attention. Because people want compelling evidence that the greater one lives. It's important for the world. It's important for the church. But it's important for you. Because you see, if all we ever do is spend our lives studying the doctrine... We'll build our understanding. But the problem with it is we go through life motivated by knowledge and not passion. Nobody wants to read the encyclopedias. <laughs> I'm not saying the word is not important. But what I'm saying is perhaps the way that we viewed the word has to change. What I'm saying is, if the word doesn't introduce us to encounters, what do you have? I have knowledge. And I don't want your knowledge. I don't want your ideas. I want your encounter. I want your compelling evidence. Don't tell me greater is the one who is there that is in me than he that's in the world. Show it to me. I want to see it. That's called a compelling evidence. And when God starts to work in your life in ways that, that is focused on encounters, that's where your passion will come from. That's where you'll get excited. That's where you'll be like, I want more of this. I like this. That's what it's about. What I'm proposing to you and what I want to really show you today is that the word is really, the objective of the word is not to get you to a place of understanding. It's to introduce you to life. It's not to get you to a place of knowledge. It's to introduce you to life. It's not to swell your head. It's to transform you. So it's a very important part in things, But perhaps what we've done is we've taken it and we've misused it in a natural context as opposed to a spiritual context. My life, my, my spirit is life. My spirit is life. That is probably the closest definition we have to what spirit is. My spirit is life. What it's saying is, both in nature and in function, everything that my nature does is life-giving. It is life. If you touch my nature, you're touching life. Everything that my nature touches produces life. That is why the work in the Holy Spirit is all life-giving. Everything that he's doing in your life is introducing you to aspects and avenues of life in, in its different um, demonstrations. My spirit is life. My spirit is life. And at the end of that verse, he says, my words are spirit and life. My words are spirit and life. There is a commonality. There is something that operates between the spirit that's on the inside of us, which is life-giving in nature, and the words that I speak, which are spirit and life. Why is that important? If you have a look at his words, Jesus' words is always living seed. Living seed, it's life. It carries within it the life of whatever it represents. Like an apple tree carries within it the life of an apple tree. You plant it, an apple tree will grow. A pear carries within it the life of a pear tree. You plant it, a pear tree will grow. The word carries within it the life of whatever is the word is about. If it's a word about healing, it carries the word of healing on the inside of it. If it's about deliverance, it carries the word of deliverance on the inside of it. It carries within it life. But he doesn't just say it's life. He says it's spirit as well. 
What he's talking about is he's talking about the nature of the words that I speak. And what he's saying is this. If you want to realize the, the life that's inside of the seed, you have to take something that is spiritual, a seed that is spiritual, and you have to plant it in soil that is spiritual. You have to take the seed which is full of life and plant it in soil which is full of life. Because when spirit and life comes in contact with spirit and life, all of a sudden germination takes place and something begins to grow. Something begins to grow. He put his life on the inside of you for a reason. Why? Because he wants to re you to realize through encounter everything that's in his word. The problem with maps of Christians is that we embraced the journey, but we just never went to the end. What we did is we took the word of God and we put it into our mind and we processed it through our intellect and through our emotions. But he says, what's flesh is flesh. My seed doesn't germinate in a nature that's not spirit. You're putting it in your mind, and I'm glad you're getting an understanding of it, and that's fine. But it was never the intention. The intention is it has to go deeper than your thinking. It has to go deeper than your emotions, because it's got to get down to the soil of the spirit where the life is. When the seed, which is spirit and life, is put into the soil of the spirit, which is on the inside of you, which is spirit and life, that's when germination happens. That's the problem with so many people who want to intellectualize the gospel. They started on the journey, but they got stuck on what I know, and they never walked into an encounter. It never went any lower than here. And so they've got a whole bunch of seeds sticking up here. Do you know that you can keep seed as long as you want, as long as you keep it in the packet? Until you put it into the soil, it never germinates. We have so many people who know so much, and I celebrate the fact that they know a tremendous amount. The problem with it is I don't want to know your doctrine. I don't want to know your thinking. I don't know, want to know your understanding. I don't want to know your knowledge. I want to know your encounter. Did it get beyond what you think down to the spirit that's on the inside of you? Where is it in your life? So it becomes something which is an invitation to all of us to say, it has to go a whole lot deeper than what I know. It has to go deeper than what I know. In Mark chapter 5, it tells the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She says, if I, it says she heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. You hear from words. She heard about Jesus. She obviously heard that he was the healer. She heard about what he had done. She grabbed hold of something which is spirit and life. She had it on the inside of her and it began to affect her and it, used to build, and it built up an appetite on the inside of her. It built up something that said, you know what? There has to be a completion of this somewhere because if I can just put myself in a place, if I could just get to that space where I can just reach out and touch him, I know something will happen. She didn't think about it the way that we do because we're having a look at the mechanics of what happened. All she knew is if I could touch him, something was, would happen. That's what God wants to do. That's right there is exactly the compelling reason why we should be reading the word. Because when you read the word, it should develop an appetite in you that says, I want to experience this. Right, I want this in my life. Not because I know about it, but if I, I want to take that, and if I can take spirit and life, and I can reach out and I can touch spirit and life, the power will hit it, and all of a sudden germination will take place, and I'll walk into an encounter. It doesn't happen because you get stuck halfway in the pit stop, and it's sitting up here with the way that you think about it. It can even affect your emotions, which is even worse, because the problem is that you're easily deceived. I just love God, and He's so fair, and that's a good thing. The problem with it, did it get beyond your emotion? Yeah, did it get down where it touched spirit and life? Because yeah. if it never got there, you'll never realize the fruit. You'll never realize the fruit. If I could just touch Him. If I could just touch Him. What happened when she touched him? What happened when she touched him was something that was spirit in nature that carried within it the seed of healing, was looking for opportunity. And when she reached out and touched him, what she touched was spirit. 
And when she touched spirit, the life that was in spirit, the power hit the life that was in the seed. And all of a sudden it germinated. And she said, I'm healed. We often look at the woman's perspective, but today I want to look a little bit from Jesus' perspective. Because Jesus stops and he says, who touched me? Who touched me? And he goes on and he says, I felt power go out of me. What was he saying? Who germinated a seed off me? <laughs> Who germinated a seed off me? That's what he was saying. Somebody came to me with spirit. And life. And they came in the expectation that if I put spirit and life, and connected with spirit and life, something would ignite and change would happen. Who did it? And everybody else around him is oblivious except for him and the woman. The two of them are having a conversation. Everybody else is like, Jesus, you confused. Jesus, you don't understand. And he's like, you, I'm not talking to you. Who? Who germinated a seed of me? with all of our teaching and all of our reading and all of our preaching of the word, really what we're trying to do is to gain an understanding of the word. And we think that if we understand the word, it'll liberate the blessing that's in the word. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We know so much about the word and doctrine. But we know so little about spirit and life. We know so little about spirit and life. How does that equation work? How do I get to the place where I'm able to live from spirit and life that's on the inside of me? Because when I develop that, when I have a hunger for that, when I'm prepared to sacrifice to get to that place, that's when I realize encounters. That's when I realize encounters. When that becomes most important in our lives, more than anything else, that's when we reach encounters. Word is a dangerous thing because it can lead you into an encounter or it can swell your head. And when it swells your head, we get deceived because we think we're spiritual. Look at the Jews in the time of Jesus. They were very zealous for the word. All of life revolved around the temple. People went to the temple all the time with regularity. They had discussions with regularity about what word meant and interpretation of word and the original Hebrew. And the diff they discussed it ad infinitum. But when Jesus arrived, they never recognized the Christ. They never recognized the Christ. Look what Jesus says. John 5 verse 39. 40 says you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me and you will not come to me that you may have life what he was saying to them was this you know what you've taken the word and you've interpreted it according to your understanding and you've come up with a conclusion the problem with it is the conclusion that you came up with is not right the problem is you were so wrapped up in what you thought that you never left any room for the Spirit to introduce you to revelation. Because if he had, he would have introduced you to Christ. If you'd used the Spirit when Christ came on the scene, you would have been like, I see him. There he is. We miss him all the time. Anytime we move to a place of understanding as opposed to encounter. I think I know who God is. I think I know how he's going to act. I think I know what he's going to do. And I live in the expectation of this being my paradigm of God. And God's acting over there, but that can't be God because that, that's not the way I see him. We miss him. 
We miss him. Because you don't come to me. You don't come to me. You see, the woman with the issue of blood, she recognized the fact that she held within her the seed of potential. She recognized that she held within her the potential of life, something which would transform her. But she recognized that unless I went to him, nothing would happen. You could live with the seed forever, but you had to touch spirit and life on the inside of me so that it could use its power to ignite it and make something happen in your life. She recognized, I have to go to him. I have to go to him. Unless you come to me, nothing happens. What does Hebrews 11:6 6 say? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because those who come to him, those who come to him, that's the whole premise. That's what faith life is all about. The faith life is all about encounters. It's not about knowledge. The faith life is sitting saying, when you get the word, his expectation is, I come to him. Not I go to my head. Not I go to my thoughts. Not I go to my emotions. I go to him. Where is he? In here. I cleaned you out so I could move in. They had to go and find Jesus. He moved in. Because why? We're a society of convenience. Unless it's really desperate, we would never run off and find Jesus. But we like convenience. God says, I'll make your life convenient. I'll put my life on the inside of you. I'll put my life on the inside of you, but you've got to come to me. You get the word, you get something, you have to come to me. Don't take it to your thoughts or your emotions. You bring it to me. Must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. It's the life of faith. It says I may not be able to see it. I may not be able to articulate it, but I know what I'm hoping for and everything that I'm hoping for is on the inside of me because the life giver that's on the inside of me is the one who can make it happen. So I go to him, believing and knowing that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. A reward of those who diligently seek him. I ran out of time. God has set up an incredible, an incredible equation for us to walk into victorious living, for us to realize what it is to have encounters with him. The gospel was set up for encounters. It's called the good news for a reason. It's not called the Bible, the encyclopedia. It's an invitation to encounter. What he says to you is, I've put on the inside of you my spirit, and my spirit's very nature is life. I've given you my word, which is spirit and life. If you will take that which is spirit and life, that which carries on the inside of it the seed of promise, and you will get it to the place where you take it beyond your intellect and your thinking. If you get it beyond your emotional set, and you take it and you come to me, what will end up happening is, I'll take that seed. You can plant it in the soil that carries within it the life. And all of a sudden, germination will take place and you'll have an encounter. Don't look for the theatrics. Don't look for all. Look for change. Look for transformation. You may get something that you least expect. It may be wild, but it may not be. I will tell you this. I think that God is starting to do something new and something different. And I will tell you this, that it's going to be different to what we've known before. And I'll tell you what I believe, which I don't have scripture for, but I'll tell you what I think. (laughs) If you look at the previous moves of God, where did it happen? It happened in the church. It happened at home. And so what we did is we came together as a body and we came together as a family and we enjoyed the move of God. And lots of them were looking in. It wasn't a bad thing. We did have plenty of people who came in. The point is, it was something which was designed to touch and affect the body so that they would take it and move out with it. He did something with it. I believe the new move is going to be different because God has no intention of doing something at home again. God's taking it out to the neighborhood. It's going to be different because if you think it's going to be somebody rolling on the floor laughing, that happened in church. It's going to be very different. 
I'm not saying that's not going to happen. What I will tell you is this. I'm telling you that in your context, whether it be education, whether it be business, wherever it might be, God is looking for opportunities to do something different to what he's done before. God is wanting to take the life that's on the inside of him and he wants to go and make that manifest in the world that's out there and he's going to use you to do it. I believe that's the next thing God's going to do. God's looking for people to come in who can sit and say, I had encounters this week. The whole point of church should be that we get together to share our testimonies about what happened in the world. If you're coming in here to get a testimony, you got it all wrong. You come in here to get the word which invites you into encounter. But you get your encounters out there. God is going to do something in the world. He's going to do something outside of here. He's not doing something in here anymore. Stop looking for what's happening at home. He's doing it outside. Go out into the garden and play. Yeah. 